graceful flight of the bird is only possible because its light yet strong wing muscles can generate sufficient lift and thrust. By flapping its wings, it can move the air quickly enough to keep itself in flight. A 20-foot runway is necessary to give a takeoff for this man-operated machine of the air. And defying death, the intrepid inventor himself sits at the controls and hurls himself into the sky. Man's attempts to copy the birds have traditionally failed because his body has not such an efficient weight-to-power ratio. He had to wait for the internal combustion engine, which was comparatively light, but which could put out as much as 15 or 20 horsepower. People still weren't satisfied, though. They no longer believed the doctor's ancient and gloomy predictions that the body would disintegrate at speeds over 50 miles an hour. Instead, they wanted to go faster and faster. This, and the demands of the Second World War, pushed piston engine and airframe development to their limits. Piston-engined aircraft were beginning to approach speeds of 500 miles per hour. Speeds above this, however, presented new problems. In the search for greater speed, the engines became heavy, putting great stress on the airframe, and the speed of the propeller, especially at the tip, became so fast that it was starting to become counterproductive. It was creating a lot of turbulence, but no real thrust. If man was to go faster, he needed to look for a new and more powerful engine, which didn't need a propeller. The jet engine. In this program, we'll be looking at the principles of the jet engine and trying to answer basic questions such as how does it work and what's it used for? But first of all, what is a jet engine? In the simplest terms, the squid is nature's jet engine. And the way in which it slides over the seabed is no different in principle to the way Concorde goes supersonic, seven miles above the Atlantic. All the squid does is suck in water slowly and push it out again at a higher speed. The act of forcing the jet of water out in one direction propels the squid in the opposite direction. This is known as jet propulsion and is explained in Newton's third law of motion which states that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The same principle of jet propulsion can be seen with a child's balloon. Here, of course, air is used and not water but air and water have similar dynamic properties, and the same principles apply. First, air is forced into the balloon. When the balloon is released, the tension in the rubber pushes the air back out through the nozzle at high speed. And, as stated in Newton's third law of motion, this sets up a jet reaction, pushing the balloon in the opposite direction. These basic principles have been known to man for about 2,000 years and were first demonstrated by the classical philosopher Hero of Alexandria. This invention of his uses nozzles to point jets of steam in one direction and then the engine revolves in the other. Hero also introduced a vital new element into the equation, heat. But as the squid forces out a jet stream by using the muscles of its body and the balloon similarly used elastic tension, Hero's engine, however, used heat. It's this heat that builds up pressure and forces the jet of steam at speed out through the nozzles. Hero just thought of his engine as a toy. In the first century AD, this was the fashionable plaything for the Alexandrian jet set. And it wasn't until 1941 that the jet engine really took off. Designed by Sir Frank Whittle, 
This was the first successful jet aero engine. From it came a whole new generation of engines, some of which are still in operation today. And even now, the basic layout can be used to explain how a modern jet operates. The engine can be split up into four main areas. Compressor, combustion, the turbine, and the exhaust. The compressor has two jobs. It draws air in from outside, and it also compresses the air. Some of the air is forced into the combustion chamber at very high pressures, so that when the air and fuel are mixed together and ignited, a rapid increase in heat energy is produced. This occurs in the combustion chamber, from where the burned mixture of air and fuel is sent rushing at high speed into the turbine. As this gas expands, part of the energy is used to power the turbine, which in turn drives the compressors. Finally, the gas is directed out through the exhaust nozzle. It's lost energy through the turbine, but has accelerated through the nozzle and provides the propelling jet stream out of the back of the engine and therefore, by reaction, thrusting the engine forwards. This is the whole point of the operation, taking air in at normal speed and forcing it out at a higher speed, backwards, thus sending the engine forwards. This is the whole point of the operation, taking air in at normal speed and forcing it out at a higher speed, backwards, thus sending the engine forwards. It may sound absurd, but it really is very simple. And it works. It's important to remember that these individual stages form a complete and continuous working cycle. A constant generation of power. And here are both the advantages and disadvantages of the way in which a jet engine works. On the one hand, the jet engine has relatively few moving parts, and as it's a very efficient method of producing power, it can be small and light for a given output. On the other hand, the components at the hot end of the engine have to be able to withstand tremendous and continuous operating pressures and temperatures. All the sections of the engine are designed to make the flow of air through the engine as efficient as possible. The compressor does this by having both rotating and stationary blades, or rotor and stator blades. The rotor blades take the air and force it backwards through the engine, while the stator blades channel the air so that it hits the next series of rotor blades as cleanly as possible. As the air is pushed through the compressor, the space available for it is reduced, and it gets literally packed in. So much so that compression ratios of 30 to 1 are possible. The compressor is driven by the turbine. One turbine can drive the whole compressor, but now there are often two or three turbines in an engine, each with a separate shaft that rotates a different section of the compressor. The fact that the sections can then rotate at different speeds means it's easier to maintain the correct overall flow of air through the engine, and the entire engine can be made shorter and stiffer. When the air reaches the combustion chamber, it's at a pressure of up to 450 pounds per square inch and is travelling at more than half the speed of sound. Fuel is difficult to burn under these conditions, and so a combustion chamber provides the correct environment an area of more slowly moving and swirling air that is sprayed with fuel. This mixture will ignite, and the increase in heat energy is quite considerable. The burning gas can be as hot as 2,000 degrees centigrade, and at this sort of temperature, the metal the turbine blades are made of will melt. However, the influx of colder air that had not been taken through the combustion chamber but diverted for cooling purposes, brings the operating conditions in the turbine down to a manageable 1,000 degrees or so. In some ways, the turbine is the compressor in reverse. Nozzle guide vanes channel the gas onto the turbine blades,
which are shaped so that the gas flowing over them is used to generate the optimum power. The blades are slotted onto a disc which rotates around the shaft that is connected back to the compressor. Often, as well as driving the compressor, the turbine will also provide ancillary power or even drive a propeller. It's vital that turbines are perfectly designed and manufactured. Just this one stage, the high pressure turbine can generate 50,000 horsepower, at which point the blades will be spinning at 1,500 feet per second. That's over a thousand miles an hour. So everything must be done to ensure that the passage of the gas through the turbines is as smooth as possible. Similar care is taken as the gas leaves the engine through the propelling nozzle. It's these exhaust gases that provide the thrust to power the engine, so it's essential that they're propelled from the engine at exactly the right speed and pressure. This is largely determined by the size and shape of the propelling nozzle that can give a kick to the gases as they leave the engine. The completed engine is, of course, a vast and complex affair once the noise suppression, cooling, lubrication, electrical, fuel and other systems have all been added. But the four sections of the working cycle remain unaltered. The compressor, the combustor, the turbine and the exhaust. All the engine parts, when seen on their own, can appear grey and immobile even dull and uninteresting. But appearances can often be deceptive. The jet engine was invented in the search for speed and power, and this component will soon be breaking the sound barrier. Soon after the invention of the jet engine, it was decided that brute force alone wasn't enough, and designers started to look for ways to develop this newfound source of power. The type of engine that we have been looking at is called the turbojet. It was the first kind of jet to be made, and it remains the best for high speeds as it's very powerful but small, and has a low frontal area, so it can be easily streamlined. The turbojet can be made even more powerful by adding reheat. In this system, fuel is sprayed into the exhaust and lit, so there's a second combustion stage, which provides extra thrust. Reheat is generally used only for short periods, to give extra acceleration, such as on takeoff. On landing, however, Deceleration is wanted, and then thrust reversers are used. These are flaps that move to divert the gas forwards rather than backwards through the exhaust. This has the effect of slowing the aircraft down. As the jet reaction tries to propel the engine in the opposite direction to the airflow. A development of the turbojet is the turboprop. This has an extra turbine, which drives a propeller. Aircraft powered by a turboprop are not as fast as those powered by a turbojet, but nevertheless the turboprop remains a very efficient and economical engine. If the propeller is removed from a turboprop, then the resulting engine is called a turboshaft. The shaft is coupled to a gearbox, and through this it can drive a helicopter rotor. Much of the latest development, however, has been done on the turbofan. Here, only some of the air is fed through the compressor and combustor. The rest is partially compressed and is bypassed around the hot core of the engine. This cuts down the engine noise as it reduces the overall speed of the jet stream. This makes the engine very economical, since it's aerodynamically more efficient to have a lot of air moving relatively slowly rather than a little air, moving relatively quickly. At very high speeds, to provide the thrust needed, it's necessary to have a small amount of air moving more rapidly. 
This is why the turbo jet is used for supersonic and the high bypass ratio turbo fan for subsonic aircraft. An exciting development of the turbo fan is vectored thrust. Here there are four nozzles, two of which take the bypass air from the fan and two take the exhaust gases. The nozzles can swivel through 90 degrees so they can point down for vertical takeoff and rearwards for normal horizontal flight. The most popular example of vectored thrust is the Pegasus engine that powers the Harrier jump jet. The jet engine has come a long way since the early days of the 1940s and its development has taken many diverse but now well-established directions. For example, the Dart engine, which powers among others the British Aerospace 748, is very different in concept from the RB211 series, seen here on the Boeing 757. But both designs will see 50, maybe 75 years of service. Classic examples of the jet engine's efficiency and reliability. Although the jet was designed as an aero engine, it now has many other applications. With the addition of a free power turbine, the aero engine has been successfully adapted for industrial and marine use. By converting the gas flow into shaft power, the resulting gas turbine driver is used in a variety of applications. Pumping oil and gas through pipelines across Alaska and other countries worldwide producing electricity in the middle of nowhere, powering oil and gas production platforms. And warships of 25 world navies. In air, on land, at sea, and even for those machines that aren't sure where they are, a jet engine can provide power for almost any situation. And often variants of the same engine can be used in many different applications. Concorde is powered by four Olympus engines. Turbojets with reheat. A marine version of the Olympus engine is used on destroyers in the Royal Navy. And on aircraft carriers, like the Invincible, the Gnome, a turbo shaft, powers both this small hovercraft and many of the larger helicopters. In fact, the jet is invaluable wherever an efficient and very powerful engine is needed. The turbofan RB211 serves not only many industrial applications, but also the massive Boeing 747 jumbo jet. An engine like the RB211 supplies enough power to heat a fair-sized town. It's precision built from materials many unknown before the space age. And yet the principle behind it is quite straightforward. The engine takes in air and pushes it out backwards, thus setting up a jet reaction to push itself forwards. The principle of how a jet engine works, that's simplicity itself. But making these engines work, translating principles into practice and ideas into metal, that's the hard part. And that's another story. <laughs>